All right, fire in the hole. First Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. Give you a couple more resurrections tonight. It's important for you to get the resurrections down pat. Everyone's going to be resurrected sometime, one or one resurrection or another. Uh, you want to make sure you're resurrected and go into the right place at the end of that resurrection. Uh, you want to make sure that if you die, you know where you're going when you die. Uh, you can't make sense out of life. Hey, boy, how you doing? Good to see you. Glad you're here. Uh, you want to make sure that you have that decision taken care of so that way whether the rapture happens or not you know you're headed in the right direction death may come before the rapture I don't know when the rapture is going to take place I hope it happens soon Amen. Uh, the way things are going when you look at things you would think to yourself it can't be much longer but I'm sure they thought the same thing when Hitler was running roughshod over everybody Many people thought Hitler was the Antichrist. He certainly made a good type yep. without any question. I mean, there was not anybody at that time more anti-Semitic than he was. Hitler was a good type. Stalin's a good type. But with all of those individuals there, the things that miss about Hitler and Stalin is, is the whole world doesn't wander after him. And so they were afraid of him. When the new guy shows up, everybody's going to be in awe of him and probably happen right after the rapture happens. But here's what I want you to see. There's, two, there's a resurrection here, and this has to do with what's called the harvest. Jesus Christ is the first fruits. We talked about that the other day. And he comes up uh, there in, uh, at the, uh, uh, after three days, and he's resurrected. And at that particular time, he leads captivity captive. And then comes the harvest, and the harvest is for you and I. That's the rapture of the church. And that comes and takes place there, if you're looking at it, in 1 Thessalonians 4. I believe it'll say something along these lines. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, he says, comfort one another with what? All right, so you get comfort out of the fact that the Lord's going to come and get you one day, whether you're dead or not. Amen. So, Father, bless your word and uh, help us this evening. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, a couple things. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you for your kindness and standing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, I want you to notice it gives you some reassurance, first and foremost, of where your departed loved ones are now. Yeah. Where are they right now? Well, the Bible says they're with God. Where's with God? They're up there in the third heaven. I mentioned to you, and some of you kind of looked a little befuzzled by it, but I don't make any bones ab about saying, I don't know that they're in the New Jerusalem right now. It looks more like they're up there in the third heaven with God, and it's probably a place very similar to the Garden of Eden or what's called paradise by the Apostle Paul. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, A new man in the body, out of the body, cannot tell who was called up to the third heaven, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. And paradise was there. That means the paradise used to be in the heart of the earth. He told the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that day he showed up there. So he took the whole compartment out and led captivity captive, Ephesians chapter number 4. Now when we talked about that, uh, especially for you newer folks, you got the idea because many people teach, first of all, the Lord was crucified on Friday. He wasn't. He was crucified on Wednesday. Stayed three full 24-hour days and then came up Saturday night at 6 o'clock and wandered around there until they saw him there in the garden there when Mary saw him over there. And he said, touch me, not yet, I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, I'll give you a whole study on that at another time, but here's what you need to know. He that ascended is not he that descended first in the lower parts of the earth. And Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 40 said that as Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. That means when he went down there, his soul didn't see death. His soul went down there and he hung out with everybody there in paradise. He preached the spirits in prison there, according to what Peter says, and told them that their uh, goose was cooked, so to speak, and that their, uh, con their uh, condemnation was sure, took the keys of hell and death, crossed the great gold fixed, and then had a time there with him, and then led captivity captive. Now, that's a picture of a resurrection that comes up with Christ the firstfruits. Now, what's the next portion of that? The next portion would be for those individuals, both living and dead, that the Lord gets at a thing we call the rapture. 
big hullabaloo about that right now because the word rapture is not in the Bible. Neither is the word Trinity. You say, well, but Trinity's not in the Bible, preacher. And that, yeah, but the Godhead's in the Bible. And the deity of Christ is in the Bible. And you can't miss God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And you might lose your mind trying to, get to, to understand it, but you lose your salvation. You can't be saved if you don't believe it. Right. We're not monotheistic. We don't believe in one God. We believe in one God and three persons. Yeah. Three manifestations of the same God, all of them God. How is that possible? It's not intended for a human mind to be able to fully grasp that. But you have to believe it. You say what? You exercise that by faith. You exercise by faith a thing called the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. You say, what is that? That the Lord came down there through the power of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel came down there and said, blessed are there upon wom uh, among women. And you're going to bear the Son of God. He's going to be Jesus Christ. You're going to lose him when he's about 12 years of age, like a typical Baptist. But you're going you're gonna to have, I'm gonna, I, I've, I've decided you're going to be it. And you're going to be a virgin born Christ. You say, surely you don't believe that. It can't be anything but virgin born. You can't have man involved in it. The bloodline's no good. All God and all man. He's up there on the cross and in one place he's playing part of the deity and the other place he's a man. He says, my God, my God. That's God there. But when he steps over into the idea of being a man, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a man down there in hell burning. Time of the roasting of the Paschal Lamb. Oh, preacher, that's just too far out for me. Your sins had to be paid for, ladies and gentlemen. And the blood of Jesus Christ had to be the, what gave you that atonement. And somebody had to pay the price. And he paid it, and you don't have to. You'd be a fool if you didn't take that. But this thing that he did, what he did for you was, is he ensured that if you get in Jesus Christ, that the assurance of that is, is that whether you're dead, Paul said, for me to live as Christ, but to die as gain. For me to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'd rather go ahead and be with the Lord, but for your sakes and for the cause of Christ, I'll stay around and hang out with you for a while. But when Paul comes to the end of his journey, Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. Henceforth, lay me a crown. Let me out of here. I'm ready to go. Now, the struggle you'll have as a Christian is, is that when you get close to the Lord, you'll have this pull, this intensity, this feeling, I want to get out of here. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't fit in here anymore. I'm not comfortable anymore. Everything just kind of agitates you and irritates you. It's just this carnal slop jar all the time. And you just feel like, you know what? This world has no luster for me whatsoever. If the Lord gives me a choice, let me go ahead and go now. You say, what is that? That's the Lord agitating you to make you ready to go to heaven. Sometimes he takes loved ones home, doesn't he? You say, why? Makes you long to go to the other side. Sometimes trouble comes your way, doesn't it? Sometimes disease comes your way, doesn't it? Sometimes financial problems come your way. Sometimes your heart gets broken because of some boyfriend or some girlfriend or because of some tragedy in your own relationship and things like that transpire. You say, what does it make you do? It makes you worn out with the world. Tired of it. I've had enough. You say, what does the Lord do that? He does that to knock the shine off the things in the world. To take off that, what I'll call fool's gold. It helps you to keep things focused. You might be successful. You might be prosperous. You might uh, do well. You might live a comfortable life. But it should never outshine going home to heaven. No matter how comfortable you might be and how well you might be doing, it should never outshine. Well, you know, if the Lord lets me go, I'd just soon go now. I'm ready to go now. You say, well, what are you doing? I'm not going to have you drink the Kool-Aid or run around and shoot you in the back of the head like you know, Ghana, they did in Ghana there with Jim Jones and, and that kind of thing. I don't believe in that foolishness. But I do believe that a Christian should be ready to depart at any time. Amen. I believe if the Lord were to call you home tonight, you ought to say, well, praise the Lord, it's time for me to go. No point in me staying around. If he's ready to punch my ticket, let him punch my ticket. You say, well, preacher, don't you fear death? No, I don't fear death. I feel how you can, fear how you can die. I don't fear death. I fear how you can die. I've seen people die a lot of ways, and some of them are real painful. And I'm, I'm just telling you. Now, you see, you, y'all are like, oh, don't bother me, man. I, not me. I've seen some of them, man, suffer going through that in the last moment. I don't, I don't want to go like that. I, I'd li I'll tell you how I'd like to go. I'd like to go right now. I mean, I don't want to feel an elephant sitting on my chest and me up here and y'all running up here trying to take care of me and somebody kissing me in the mouth other than my wife trying to blow <laughs> and go back there and get the paddles and you don't know exactly where to put them and put them one on my feet and one on my head and, you know, make me jump, do the chicken and all. That don't, that don't interest me. I'd like the Lord to just drop me like a sack of taters. Now you say, why? Because I'm chicken, man. 
I mean, they talk about, you know, getting the, the martyrs. I read every now and then I'll read a few paragraphs, a few pages about all I can take anymore. I've read through the whole Fox's Book of Martyrs and the whole Martyr's Mirror. That's a book about the size of an encyclopedia. And now I just read it and it reminds me of it. And I see those people, I mean, that suffered, sure enough, having their fingernails torn out and their teeth punched out of their heads and things like that. Shot out with a BB gun, I believe Brother Joey said today. I've known other people to use BB guns on other people other ways, but, but I've seen, I'm thinking, man, that'd have to hurt, man. <laughs> but I've seen that kind of stuff. You know what I think to myself? I don't want to go like that. But you know what I do know? I know that somewhere in there, God's grace must step in. And I see those individuals grabbing hold and latching hold of that pole and kissing and embracing that pole. I've seen them holding on to those chains and say, lash me down tightly for I feel my flesh may struggle in this great day of me being released. Yeah, I bet it does jump around, man. They light those fires underneath you and burn you. They throw your kids in burning oil and do that kind of stuff. Disembowel you while you're up there and have the pigs eating your insides until they eat you alive and stuff. There's all kind of ways to go. I don't want to go like that. But I do know this. I know if the Bible's right because I'm in him, I know in whom I am believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep me against that day, that this principle I'm going to show you is a guaranteed resurrection. And you put me down, you don't have to worry about leaving the coffin loose or, you know, leaving the dirt loose or anything like that. I'm going to come just like the Lord came right out there, didn't need to roll the rock away, just like he walked through the door. I'm going to come up out of the ground. Amen. I don't know that the dirt's going to get thrown around. I don't know that that's going to transpire. I couldn't tell you. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 52, where we were in Ephesians 4 the other day, the bodies of many of the saints which slept arose and went into the holy city. But there's no historical account of there being a bunch of empty graves. So it looks like they may have passed through those uh, graves, may have passed through those caskets, may have come out of those catacombs. I don't know how that might be. But I gave you that verse there in 1 Thessalonians 4 to first of all give you the assurance that if you're saved, when you die, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Amen. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're in the city of gold, in the streets of gold, in the gates of pearl. You get that later on. That's back in, out in Revelation. We'll get to that in just a minute, the great white throne. What you need to know is, is that if your loved ones have gone on ahead of you, they're on the other side, on the hillsides of glory right now. You say, what are they doing? Having the time of their life. You say, are they ready for judgment? They're not thinking about judgment right now. Judgment seat hadn't taken place. They're not up there forlorn and rubbing and nervous and all that kind of stuff. They're at complete peace. They're not sleeping. Why would the Lord waste time with the saints to put you to bed with a shovel and have you sleep in a hole in the ground? What would be the benefit of that? He'd take you up there and show you the time of your life. Listen, if you happen to get cut out of here before the rapture takes place and before we see the New Jerusalem uh, clothes as a bride coming down from, our, uh, from, uh, from God out of heaven, if He takes you out of here before that, trust me, what He's got waiting for you out there is better than what you got now. Amen. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring you. You have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring you. You can't, you can't prophesy and say, well, tomorrow, you know what you better say? You better say, if the Lord wills. You better say, if the Lord wills. I, I might get up tomorrow morning, if the Lord wills. I might make it to the doctor, if the Lord wills. I might get back home, if the Lord wills. I can't prophesy that. I can't tell you I'm going to make it home tonight. I hope to. But so what I'd have to tell you is I'm guaranteeing you that those of you that have already buried loved ones, and as we get older, we put more and more and more of them in the ground. That Bible says and those that are with God, God brings with them. You say, where are they? They're in His presence right now. They're not in a hole in the ground. They're not asleep. Amen. They're awake. Amen. And the Lord says, y'all, come on, we're going down here. What are we going to do? So I'm going to go down there and pick up that body. Lord, I don't want that rag back. Are you going to give me that body back? Thanks for playing the horn tonight. I appreciate it. I about tagged you this morning, but I was afraid you might take the leap of faith from up there. But <laughs> Okay, all right, well, good. We could have got you a kazoo. <laughs> you know what I know? I know that according to what that Bible says, that Bible teaches you that when you're uh, up there, when you die, that you come back down here and you'll have a disdain for this thing. Yes. You say, why? You think so much of it now. Because yep. yep. it's your identity. It means so much to you. It carries you everywhere and does everything for you. And, you know, it's always displeased with whatever you're doing. It's never happy. Have you ever noticed that about it? It ain't never happy. It's always griping and complaining all the time. I mean, constantly. It's just giving you a fit all the time. You know what? All of a sudden, you get in up there with the Lord. Let's say you've been up there. It'll seem like eternity. Let's say you've been up there 15 minutes. 
but there's no time in eternity. So you're going to feel like you've just been there. And then all of a sudden the Lord said, okay, let's go. And you go, why do I have to go back down there? You say, how do you get that? What do you think Paul said? Lord, I don't want to go back down there. That old broke up body down there laying out the sides of the streets of Leicester down there. I don't want to go back down there and do that. You've lost your mind. I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine up here. You're going down there. Paul got in that body again. And man, them bones were broken and creaking around and stuff like that. And he gets up and he said, I'll put a stop to this. He went right back in the place that stoned him and tried to get stoned again. I don't mean stoned. <laughs> I have to clarify that nowadays for some of y'all any, anymore. I forgot I'm not in Colorado right now. We're in Colorado. We talk about gummy bears. But, but let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. If your loved ones are gone, they're perfectly safe with him right now. I uh, say, do they look down here? Hebrews 11 says, we're compassed to grout with so great a cloud of witnesses. Do you think it would be heaven if your departed loved ones could look down here and watch your life? You really think you're living that good of a life? You think you're living that holy of a life? You think that that would be heaven to them? Why, man, you would think hell had got transplanted up there into heaven if all of a sudden they look down here and follow Christians around down here and looking at people like that. They, what a dumb thing to say, man. There's no record of somebody going down here. Let me, well, you get to watch them. You know, now, hey, Granny's watching you. Granny ain't watching me. She ain't Granny no more. She ain't got that old vile body anymore. She's up there having the time of her life and she is fully occupied with whatever's going on up in heaven right now. The Bible's silent on a lot of that. I can't tell you for sure what's going on up there right this moment. Except perfect peace, perfect happiness, perfect joy, perfect uh, uh, completion, uh, being completely satisfied, everything as good as it could possibly be beyond our ability to be able to comprehend it. So number one, the people that have already gone on, they're safe. They're there now. They're up there in heaven. What do they do? They come down and they get their body. 1 Corinthians 15, we shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. Suddenly in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's 1 Corinthians 15, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's the same event in two record or two accounts, one to Corinth and one there to Thessalonica. And he's telling you there's coming a day where a resurrection is going to take place and it is a physical bodily resurrection. It's not a spiritual resurrection, nobody can see it and all that. It is a resurrection of your vile body when your vile body is changed into a body like unto his body. In 1 Corinthians 15, he tells you very clearly, that which is corruptible must put on incorruption, and that which is mortal must put on immortality, and that which is sown in weakness must be raised in strength. Uh, the, what goes in the ground, the seed that goes in the ground, doesn't resemble what comes up out of the ground. Have you ever put a seed in the ground, and that new plant that comes up, the beautiful flower or a fruit tree or something, it doesn't resemble the seed. You won't resemble that. As a matter of fact, isn't you, aren't you larger than the seed? Suppose you come back and you're nine feet tall. Well, you don't know. I mean, how big's the seed when it went in? Some of you that have a, a, your height challenge, you might think, well, that kind of sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> but, but pause and think about that for just a minute. You say, what are you going to be? You'll be conformed to his image. Amen. What is his image? It's not a Catholic picture of him with blonde hair and blue eyes. Amen. You say, what is it? Isn't it interesting? Nobody ever bothered to paint a porter of, portrait of him. Why can't you find a portrait? There's portraits painted back there, painted long before Christ was ever on the earth. Why no portrait? Why nobody ever had him sit for a painting? <laughs> I mean, the only thing I see is Michelangelo had a Polaroid camera back in the day, and he said, all y'all want to be in this picture, get on this side of the table. And, you know, he snapped the picture there. But that, all of that right there is all a facade. Where's the pictures of him? You say, what is he going to be like? I don't know. I don't think you can imagine it. I think the Lord intentionally made sure that there wasn't any uh, uh, photographic copy of him. He wants you to get it from the book. Eyes like a dove and bushy black hair. But then in another place, he's the Ancient of Days. And he's white-headed. And other places you see him where he's got feet of their burnished brass and, and those kinds of things. When you start reading about him, he has all kinds of ways of looking about it. Now what that happens is, as your body gets changed and you get caught up together with them, how long are you going to be down here in between? I couldn't tell you, but the change is instantaneous. That means if you're walking around when the Lord comes, you're going to be walking around like this one day, and then all of a sudden you're going to hear a, a horn blow, and before you get called to come up hither, your body's going to change. You've got knee pain, it'll be gone just like that. And you're going to think, 
And you're going to reach up there on your head and you're going to think, man, what are these glasses? Something happened with the glasses. And you're going to look out there and you're going to throw the glasses down and go, man, I don't get them. And false teeth are going to fall out of your head and you're going to have real choppers. Real choppers. And if you couldn't sing before, you'll be able to sing like Jesus. You'll be like the leper that came back in Luke 17. He didn't just get healed, he got whole. You get all of it. The boy back there won't roll around ever again. He'll, he, he won't be in a hurry to sit down when we, he gets that new body. I'm just telling you right now. Who's that back there? That's Brother Yoakum. How come he don't sit down? He's been sitting his whole life nearly. He ain't interested in sitting up here in heaven. Just wait, wait, wait a few hundred years. He ain't going to be in a hurry to sit down. <laughs> you say, preacher, it can't. Yeah, it'll be just like that. And then all of a sudden you're going to feel kind of light and kind of feel... Man, something's going to happen. And you see the resurrected ones that are coming up and saying, Hey, how are you doing? Boy, it sure is good to see you. Yeah, wait till you see where we're going. And you're going to be caught up right through the ceiling. Wherever you're at, the ceiling of your car, the ceiling of an airplane, uh, out of going out of, a, uh, out of a ship or something, or out of your uh, car, wherever you are inside your house, you're going to go right up through that thing. Your molecular structure will line up with the molecular structure of whatever makes up the steel and all the stuff that's up there above your head. And right up through the universe, you're going to go, and hundreds of thousands of you are going to go up at the same time Amen. to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. I hope we levitate for just a little while. <laughs> Y'all are such great people. I know you can't wait to get there. I want to get up. and I, kinda, I just kind of want to tell just a couple of people I told you so. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to miss heaven doing it. But I just, there's just a couple of people I just want to say, I told you. Amen. Rapture's in the Bible. Amen. I told you. Amen. We're caught up. Now, let me ask you this question before we move on to this next resurrection. What problem do you have that the rapture wouldn't cure? Amen. What problem did you have at this time last year? Why, you probably don't even remember. You were consumed with it. You say, what happens? The Bible's not just about living a clean life. It's about having peace and calm and assurance to know that no matter how bad and difficult the problems are compared to eternity, they're not even a speck of dust on a timeline. God gives you that as an assurance to let you know, I got you. I'm coming to get you. Hang in there just a little while longer. Just a little while longer. Well, how long is it going to be, preacher? I don't know. Most people that want to know the day of the rapture, they don't want to know the day of the rapture because they're looking forward to seeing the Lord. They want to know so they can live wicked right up to the last possible minute. For some reason, the Lord's bailed that. And maybe He moves that. I used to joke with the old preacher, and I said, I wish you'd quit quiet to figure the thing out. And he said, why is that? And I said, well, because every time you come up with something, I think He moves it just because you figured it out. <laughs> What? You know, I said, well, I mean, you know, I mean, I think we should have been gone in 88 or 89. I'll take 90 or 92 or I'm, I'll jump in with camping. 90s, let's go. You know, I don't care. Let's just go, right? In 2000, in 2012, and what a drag, man, 2024, and I'm still here. Listen, I love life. I enjoy it. I love doing what I do. I love being able to be here. I love, appreciate uh, y'all allowing me to be your pastor. I, I really do love life. But you give me the choice of getting out of here. I'm telling you right now, I love my wife. I ain't going home to get her. Right. I'll meet her in the air. Amen. I, I told her, I said, hey, baby, I love you. If I don't make it back tonight, she said, you better not pray for the rapture. I said, if, I, if he asks me, I'm going to pray. <laughs> And I said, whatever we got to face next week or whatever we got going on, it'll be fixed in the moment. Twinkle. She goes, well, yeah, there's that. And I said, I'll meet you on the way up. Yeah. You are going in the right direction, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> now, think about that for a minute. Shouldn't that give you some peace? Yes, Shouldn't that let you know that no matter what the situation is, that you know that the Lord's got you covered both ways, whether you're dead or whether you're alive. Amen. You're wanted. You should be in the FBI's 10 most wanted. You say, you're wanted dead or alive. God cares about you if you die, and God keeps you if you're alive. That should give you great peace. It should let you know, okay, well, guess what? I got it. All right, come to Revelation now. I want to show you something here about the great white throne. 
Now, let me make sure you understand, when you go to the judgment seat of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, the judgment seat of Christ is not for uh, unbelievers. The judgment seat of Christ is for Christians, saved people. If you're taking notes here tonight, and you don't have time to get into all of that stuff, but when you're resurrected there at the rapture, when that takes place, you go up there and the judgment seat of Christ happens. And the judgment seat of Christ is in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Uh, where he says that every man will be judged for the work done in the body, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Uh, and he says every man will give an account for that work that's done there. And you'll acknowledge what you did. And then he said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, he said that you go to the judgment seat of Christ to be tried for the things in the fire. And it would be gold, silver, precious stones if you did right, and wood, hay, and stubble if you didn't. And then there's five crowns that you get at the judgment seat of Christ that can be uh, earned by you during that time period. That's for individuals that are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ in a period called the church age. No one else goes to the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Now, if you don't get anything else I said, don't get these two things confused. Right. The great white throne judgment is not your judgment. If you're here tonight and you're lost, then you're going to hell. And then after you come up out of hell, you get to come up at this judgment. And you get to match your righteousness with none other than Jesus Christ. And if your righteousness can top His, you can get in. And if you can't, then you're going to go to hell, I mean go to the lake of fire, and you're going to burn until God dies. You say, you really believe that? Yeah, it's called the doctrine of hell and the lake of fire. And I believe that 100%. You say, why? Why else get saved? Why did you get saved, preacher? I was seven years of age. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. That's why. Amen. Well, you know, you should have had a different motive than that. What, what more do I need as a motive as a seven-year-old boy other than I don't want to burn and pay for my own sins? You, you make it so theologically difficult sometimes. People can't get their head around it, man. Listen, I don't want to go to hell and burn, period. Amen. Just try to stick to the basics of the gospel. Stop trying your best to, you know, give them everything you can possibly give them and give them what took you 60 years to learn in the first place. Let's just get them out of hell first, okay? And then once you get them out of there, you've got, insurance, you've got plenty of time to talk with them. By the way, a lot of times you spend time wasting time talking to people that aren't even saved yet. You say, why? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, uh, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So what do you have to do? But in order for them to have the ability to understand what you're saying, they got to be saved. They can understand the gospel. So give them the gospel. Don't dilute it. Don't pollute it. Don't, don't worry about doing it. Listen, use your own testimony. God done anything for you? Just tell them when you got saved. You worry, the Holy Spirit will work out the details. A woman at the well, did you ever look at her? She went, to, well, I'm sorry, she went to a soul winning class and a new members class and a discipleship class and a, you know, how to have a more fruitful uh, a life and a financial class. And then she had to go to a class on marriage, divorce and remarriage because she'd been married five times. Oh, I forgot, those weren't her husbands. <laughs> she had to go to an adulterer's class and all that kind. And once she got all that done, then she went, was able to go witness. No, she wasn't an independent Baptist. <laughs> She didn't need anybody to tell her, let me just tell you what he did for me. Amen. He told me everything I ever did. Amen. Well, just tell him what he did for you. You don't have to put your filth out there. Right. No, yeah, listen, nobody's going to be, you're not going to shock anybody. The Lord saved you from a deeper pit than the other guy. Don't make a competition out of it. Yeah. He saved you from hell. Yeah. Good enough. Amen. How did he do it? By the blood of Jesus Christ. I came to Calvary. I trusted him. I admitted I was a sinner. I believed the Lord Jesus Christ. And I confessed him as my Savior. What did you do about your sins? I repented. I turned away and said, I don't want to go that way anymore. Well, did you name him? No, I named him. I admitted I was a sinner. Not name them all. I'd be still there. I'd still be kneeling there. You say, why? And the longer I read the Bible, the more guilty I become. That's why some of you don't read it, isn't it? I mean, you're better than most, but if you keep reading, you'll find you're guilty of something. All right, this passage in Revelation chapter number 20, this has to do with a resurrection. And this is not for believers. Now, it will be for Old Testament saints. I'll show you that in just a minute in Revelation 11, and it'll shock some of you. Revelation 20, verse 11, I saw the great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there's no place found for them. No, no place to run, no place to hide. And I... 
I, excuse me, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Can I ask you a question? Are you judged when you get into heaven by your works? No, there's no verse at all that says you're judged by your works. You're judged at the judgment seat of Christ by what you did for Him. has nothing to do with your salvation. This has to do with your entrance into heaven. Did you do what God said to do? Tell me you shouldn't be grateful for being saved in the age of grace. Everybody's not saved the way you're saved. They had to do certain things along the way. Revelation 12 says, These are they that had the faith in Jesus Christ and kept the commandments. You have some others in Revelation 11 that had to believe the everlasting gospel. As a matter of fact, go ahead and turn there. Uh, the dead, small and great, that means it doesn't make a difference about your social status. This resurrection here is the final resurrection. And when you get resurrected to this thing here, you come there to meet your final judgment. Now, you've uh, probably asked yourself this question, and many theologians have tried to put the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament saints at the judgment seat. They're not there. They're not in the bride of Christ. How could they even be there? It wasn't even revealed until Paul came along. It was a mystery. How could the gospel be the same when nobody knew it till Paul? If you have a Bible, how could you think that? But many people do. You say, why? Because you're lazy or because you've been taught that since you were knee-high to a grasshopper and instead of admitting that you were taught wrong, then you just go ahead and, you know, keep repeating after what everybody else said. Well, the problem with that is, is now you've got uh, Old Testament saints tied in with the bride of Christ. They're not the same thing. They're not in the bride of Christ. You're, you think, uh, you, you think uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah and uh, Malachi and Moses and all them are going to be in the bride of Christ? Well, you're smarter than most preachers in Duval County because they think, oh, we'll just all be one big happy family. You must be smoking crack or something. It's not even that written that way in the Bible. Look in Revelation 11, it's parenthetical. The Lord gives you four trips through the book of Revelation. And those four trips are running like this. They're not running like this. It's not one thing and one thing and one thing. That's all going on. And he gives you four trips through there. Seals, bowls, vials, and trumpets. And they all come through there. And the Lord takes you through that. And in Revelation, 7, or Revelation 11, he breaks off in 15 to 19. And it's parenthetical. He takes a breath here and he pauses. The seventh angel sounded in the great voices of the heaven, the kingdom of this world, to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. Stepping into the millennial reign of Christ. That's after the battle of Armageddon. And the four and twenty elders sat before God on their seats and fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come. By the way, that's removed from all the other Bibles because they think He's already come and He's not coming again. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and notice hast past tent reign. The millennial kingdom's over. He's given you what's happening with a thousand year period of time. He's going from get up to get gone. The nations were angry. There's Gog and Magog. The wrath has come, the time of the dead that they should be judged. The time of the who? The dead they should be judged. But the mistake here is, is that the dead that's judged are all the wicked dead. Amen. It ain't just the wicked dead. All the Old Testament saints are going to get their reward there. You say, why? All you have to do is read a little further. They don't get their reward at the judgment seat of Christ. They get it at the great white throne judgment. And the Bible says that thou should at the time of the death that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give rewards unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear thy name small and great and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in the temple the ark of the testaments where it is now and where the lightnings and the voices and thunders and earthquake and great hail. Now what he just gave you there is is that the great white throne judgment it's the resurrection of the dead that takes place there. Come to Daniel chapter 2. Uh, 12, Daniel chapter number 12, and what winds up taking place is the Old Testament saints come up and they got a physical body there to be judged in and that'll be the time you'll get to see those Old Testament prophets and those people in Hebrews 11 and all of those individuals there. You know what you'll get to see? You'll get, them see, you'll get to see them get their reward. You'll get to see Joshua and Caleb there. Won't that be a blessing?
I bet you when Caleb comes up, even though he's been up there for a while, I bet you when Caleb comes up, I bet he says, Lord, can I have that mountain? <laughs> I bet he hadn't changed at all. You ever wonder about that sometimes? You ever think about seeing Moses? You'll see him in the tribulation. You won't see him. But then he gets his head cut off and then he comes up there and joins you for heaven. You realize you're going to be around and get to see that guy got his, get his rewards? Amen. Won't that be something? Amen. You have a favorite Old Testament prophet? I like Elijah. I'm not akin to him, but I like him. I like reading about him. I read through there about Elijah and stuff like that. I know he shows up there at the Mount of Transfiguration. Then I know he comes down here and he preaches. Him and Moses preach together, Law and the Prophets. And then they get their heads cut off and then they get resurrected and taken out. We'll talk about that later. But then the bottom line is, I want to see Elijah get what's coming to him. I want to see Isaiah and Jeremiah. Now, this is after you've seen the Lord. And now, you know what? I think there's nothing better than seeing a faithful old, faithful old saint get what God wants to give them and to see the pleasure on God's face and rewarding faithful saints. Amen. Amen. Can you imagine, man, what it'll be like? I don't think uh, Moses will come up there. I don't think he'll look like Charlton Heston, you know. <laughs> Let my people go. You know, I don't, I don't think it'll be that way. Uh, Pharaoh will show up. He won't be Yul Brynner. got to get that out of your mind. But can you imagine that you'll have on one side, you'll have Pharaoh there. On the other side, you'll have Moses there. And one of them's getting their reward in the lake of fire and the devil grabs him up and pitches him off into the, or the angel does and pitches him off into the lake of fire. And he, before he goes, he has to confess Jesus Christ is the Lord, the glory of God, the Father. And then turn right around and look over there at Moses. And Moses say, man, I sure am glad I cho chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to stay there and enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season there in Egypt. And boy, I, I sure am glad that I didn't let public school affect me the wrong way and do the wrong. Man, good night. I'm glad I made the right choice to suffer. Amen. And you know what you'll get to see? You'll get to see the two choices. Now, I don't know about you. I can tell you already what I'm going to be thinking. I know the Lord may change my mind when I get all that, but I'll tell you what I'm going to be thinking. I don't have any right to be standing here. Yep, right. Amen. Yep. I watched Aaron come up there, and I watched Joshua come up there, and Caleb come up there. I watched Dodo the Ahohite come up there, whose hand claved to the sword. I watched, uh, what's his face that uh, watched his pea patch there. Here's a good one for you. I watched David and Jonathan come up. Yes, Lord says, my prince, David. I say, hey man, I was named after you. <laughs> I get to see them there. You know what's going to come overwhelm me at that resurrection? What in the cat hair am I doing here? God gave me mine by grace. He gave me a free gift. I think for just a minute, even though the judgment seat of Christ to be over, that Bible says that tears are not wiped away until after the great white throne judgment. I think tears will be running down my cheeks and I'll feel like a dirty dog that I didn't do more for him. After I see them Old Testament saints come up there, Mary and Martha will be there. Apostles will be there. You ever think of that? Does your mind ever go there at all? What that day will be like? Do you ever think about the countless millions of people that will be cast off one at a time and thrown into the lake of fire to burn forever? And some of them lived a better life than we did. That's the judgment right there. That's the resurrection of the dead. Small and great stand before God. Presidents, kings, potentates, billionaires, trillionaires, world rulers, world renowned. Alexander the Great, he conquered the then known world, was the greatest man at 33 years of age, died a drunk, but conquered before he was 33, conquered the then known world. He's going to come up right there and give an account. And the Lord will have his prophets that are there getting their reward too. Look at Daniel chapter number 12. Look in verse number 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to change and everlasting contempt. 
that rapture that'll take place there, you wind up going up and at that last thing in the gleanings, those individuals get caught up out of the tribulation period and after the tribulation period is over with, the ones that are left down here, they die in the battle of Armageddon or they die out there in the millennial kingdom and then they wait until the end of that time period and they get hauled up there at the great white throne after heaven and earth has passed away and the Lord's got the judgment of everything there going on and down at the bottom of that thing there's a gigantic lake of fire and angels just standing and they're pitching off people like Cordwood. And Hitler will come up there and he'll be looking at the greatest Jew that ever lived. Amen. And you say, hey, how do you feel now? Are you anti-Semitic now, Hitler? You know, if that Bible's right, you know what Hitler will do? He'll curse and he'll swear and he'll bite his teeth and he'll grit his teeth and he'll have to confess just like the devil will at the end of that thing and he'll have to confess that the Jew is the one that's greater than he is and that'll be the last thought he has before he'll be cast in a lake of fire. Mussolini right behind him, Stalin right behind him, Nietzsche right behind him, Marilyn Monroe right behind him. Say, not Marilyn Monroe. You don't know the history on Marilyn Monroe. I bet you you don't know the history of Marilyn Monroe. Anton LaVey said she would be the Madonna of the Satanic Church. They don't show you that. They show you that she was raised and she was abused and she was in foster homes and she was in orphanages and, and she was dumb and she was stupid and innocent. Did you know Billy Graham went over to talk to her one day? You know what she told Billy Graham about salvation? I don't need your Jesus. The preacher, you shouldn't say that about her. Well, a lot of you worship her. A lot of you think that, you know, she's the greatest thing since sliced bread. You don't realize she was into doing all kind of occultic behaviors. Read. Just read. I'm not making it up. You'd probably Google it and probably get it off of that, I guess. But you might be surprised what you might find out. And those individuals that are connected with that stuff and you say, well, what a tragedy. Well, what a tragedy. I'll tell you the tragedy. The tragedy is, is whether or not she's with Jack or John, it doesn't make any difference. And they passed her around like a dish towel and those kind of things. And when they got done with her, they kicked her to the curb. And after she sang happy birthday and all that other kind of stuff. And then she winds up and does what? She dies and goes to hell. Yeah. That's the tragedy of that life. Yeah. The tragedy of the life isn't that she's married to Smoking Joe DiMaggio that was the professional ball player and all that other kind of stuff and she was a great movie star. And that, no, the tragedy in that story is not that she wound up dying from drug overdoses or they hot shot at her or the CIA got in there or the mob got her or whatever you want to believe about her. When she died, she's in hell right now. She's burning right now. She's screaming right now. You say, what's going to happen? If the rapture were to happen right now, you'd get out of here and after the tribulation period is over, we'll come down for the battle of Armageddon. It'll start the thousand year clock. That thousand year clock will run. The battle of Armageddon, I mean the battle of uh, Gog and Magog will take place. And after the battle of Gog and Magog takes place, heaven and earth passes away and there's no more sea and nothing's going on but a throne there and everybody being judged. And here comes Maryland. See, why do you do that? An innocent young girl taken advantage of. But the worst thing they did is she rejected Jesus Christ. Yes, right. She doesn't get any quarter. I can see Hitler going, can't you? Yes, I can see Mussolini going, can't you? I can see Stalin going and Nietzsche going. I can see that. I can see Mao Zedong going. I can see, uh, what's his name in uh, Vietnam, uh, Ho Chi Minh. I can see him going. All those people in the killing fields and the horrendous things they did to people. I don't have any problem at all with that. I like to say, oh, well, what a tragedy. I don't know. It doesn't really upset me too bad. When I see somebody innocent like that that's been taken advantage of and warped and used her entire life and then wind up rejecting Jesus Christ, I think to myself, man, what a tragedy. And I'm going to see her one day. She's not going to be glamorous and look like she did when she was out there in the movie as a movie star. You know what she's going to do? She's going to come up there as a wicked, God-forsaken sinner that's been roasted in hell for at least a thousand or twelve hundred years. And then by the end of that time, come up there and confess Jesus Christ. And the Lord's going to say, hey, Billy, come here a minute. And old North Carolina, Billy Graham with that old southern drawl will walk up there and say, yes, sir, Lord. What is it? And he said, did you witness to this young girl? Yes, sir, Lord. I went to her house there and talked with her. What did she say, Billy? Tell us all. And the whole congregation will be there. 
Billy said, man, I haven't seen a congregation like this in the stadium or when I was in Russia or China or nothing like that. He said, this is every human being from Adam all the way through and we'll get to the angels in a little while. He said, tell us, Billy, what did she say? Uh, Lord, she said she didn't need you. And he's going to look down there and say, young lady, is that true? And she's going to say, yes, sir. Can you have mercy on me? No, sir. The day of judgment is upon us. Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Out! How could a loving God do that? A loving God didn't do that. That woman did that when she rejected him. Don't you blame God for that. God gave her a way out. I would think after a miserable life like that, that she'd have at least enough sense to say, yeah, you know what? I'd love to have a man that loved me enough to, to not take advantage of me. That preacher was down preaching down in Orlando one night, uh, had a night meeting there. It's about 60 of those girls down there. Rough girl. They had on tan jumpsuits and stuff and slide shower shoes. And they came in there and Man, I'm just, I mean, skin poppers on them and busted out teeth and all kind of stuff. And hair all matted, looked like a bunch of dogs have been hiding in a junkyard somewhere. And he gets up there and he says, now girls, I'm going to teach you, ladies, I'm going to teach you something here tonight about a man that will love you like nobody's ever loved you before. And he'll never take advantage of you and he'll always care about you and he'll always uh, make sure that you're safe and always give you the security of knowing you love him. And before, I mean, you could just sense everything was going. And there was a black girl, she said, oh, Lord, I'd like to meet him. And he said, sister, if you'll stay around for just a minute, I'm going to introduce you to him tonight. And he gets up there and he gets to bragging on Jesus. Man, I'm going to tell you what. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, man, that sounds pretty good to me. I'm already saved. I'm thinking, whoo, man. I mean, he got to going. And that girl said, mm, mm, mm. I sure wish I'd have met him before now. He said, well, hang on, sister. I'm going to introduce him to you in a minute. And he came to the end and he goes, that's the introduction. Would you like to meet him? She said, yes, sir, I sure would. And she bowed her head right there in front of all those women with about 10 other women of that night. And she trusted Jesus Christ and ran headlong into him and met a man that will never do her wrong and never cheat on her and never take advantage of her and be altogether lovely always and always look out for her. You say, what, why would somebody reject that? Somebody finds themselves in hell when they leave here. You're not going to blame Jesus Christ for that. You're not going to make me feel guilty for telling you they went to hell by their own choosing. Oh, well, I'm going to get down there and get me a couple of long necks, man. Have me a good time. All my friends are going to be down there. I'll be down there with old Garth Brooks, you know, and have me some friends in low places. Careful, boy. I may have people I've known that are in low places, but I ain't going to go down there with them. A little too loose with that. Like, hey, it's going to be that way. No, it ain't going to be complete isolation. You ain't going to have friends down there. You know, you're going to run into, you run into people that you know told you and you didn't listen. They misled you and you didn't pay attention and you're going to hate them. There's nothing but hate there. Just like there's nothing but love in heaven, there's nothing but hate there. You'll hate everything. You'll hate everybody. In that place. You say what? These individuals that come up, some resurrected to everlasting life and some, boy, to everlasting damnation. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the lake of fire. I'm talking about the final solution, as Hitler used to call it. You're completely done. Look in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. It's good it gets quiet when you hear that. Used to be a day and a time when anybody got to preaching about hell, people get scared. Now they make a joke of it. Every time you turn around, they're, you know what they're saying on a regular basis, you know, they're making a joke about it. I bet you I hear hell more times out of, a, out of a person during a week period of time. I bet I hear in my circles, I bet I hear hell more times than I hear out of the pulpit in a curse word. Well, it shouldn't be that way. You say, what, what should we be doing? We should be trying to get people out. Amen. Look in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Pick it up, if you will, there in verse number 13. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Yes, Brother Joe, I got it ready. I'll be coming out probably Sunday. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. 
Is that what you want done? If I read that in the fine print of a contract right there and I said, there any way I can keep those secret things secret? <laughs> I'd be looking for a way out. Oh, that's not a good reason to get saved. Well, you must just be lily white and pure and perfect and look at the cross and see your name right there at the foot of it. I mean, you just be pure and white as a driven snow. But if you got a mind like most people got a mind, every secret thing. Now, come on, be honest. Haven't you gotten away with some things and nobody knows about it? Haven't you thought some things and God hadn't exposed it? Those people don't have protection. Every secret thing, I don't have to worry about it. My sins are under the blood. Washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I go up there like the old preacher would say, and they take out the book and say, this is the life of David Peacock and white pages. <laughs> nothing there. Nothing there. Nothing there. Well, I have nothing that I can find you guilty of. I look at the life there of Jesus Christ and my sins are on him. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want my sins known to everybody in the universe. That's what's going to happen at the final judgment. Is that what you're looking for? Come to Romans chapter 2. We'll give just a couple more and I'll let you go to the barn. Romans chapter number 2. Before I forget, y'all gave us so much food and stuff, you obviously know I can't cook or don't cook. And between that and all the cards you gave me and everything or gave us... I'll, I'll, you have to buy me a treadmill or something. Uh, but I really do appreciate it very much because um, uh, it, it's just very much appreciated. Now let me give you this thing in Romans chapter number 2. Come down to verse number oh, 5. Uh, 4. Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffer, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and, hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render every man according to his deeds. Whew. Is that what you want to be? I don't get to heaven by my deeds. Come to Luke uh, 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke 14. I get to go on the behalf of somebody else. I don't think there's a greater story. You know what's sad, I think, to me nowadays? I think what's really sad is, is that people are real, it, it's hard, we're so proud, especially in America, that we can't accept a charitable gift from individuals. And then when you present a gospel and tell somebody it's a free gift, it's like they want to work for it or something, or earn it. They just can't bring themselves to accept the goodness of God and just say, you mean God would be that good to me to forgive me and let me go to heaven on His merit? There's something about us that wants to take credit even for getting into heaven. What is that? What arrogance to think I could ever be righteous enough to make it into heaven. I mean, I'd, but it's hard sometimes. Witness to a fellow the other day, we were having just a conversation, and he said, uh, so you're a Baptist, right? And I said, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a saved Bible-believing Baptist. But yeah, you can say I'm a Baptist. He said, so you don't believe in the Trinity. <laughs> I said, what? And he goes, Baptists don't believe in the Trinity. And I said, uh, not Baptists. I know. I don't even know what you're talking about. I said, you're talking about Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right? And he goes, well, yes, sir. And he said, but y'all don't believe that. And I said, well, yeah, I do. I believe more than that. I believe that's God manifested in the flesh. And I went through all the stuff I told you a while ago. He goes, oh, he goes, well, now listen, think about this now. This is the second question. I'm talking to him about his soul. Here's the second question. Well, how do you feel about tongues? <laughs> He's a grown man. And I said, how do I feel about tongues? I said, well, first of all, I asked the Lord to give me a bridle for the one I got. He goes, oh, well, that's pretty funny. <laughs> you know? He said, but how do you feel? And I said, you mean the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And he goes, yeah. And I said, you know why most people uh, believe in speaking in tongues? And he said, why is that? I said, because it's the easiest thing to counterfeit. Yes. He said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, did they do it by the way the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14? He said, what does the Bible say? I said, well, it might be do you some good to look at it if you're going to. But I said, 1 Corinthians 14, man, and at most two, and at most by three, 
and let one interpret and the other one's witnessing and that by course and not everybody speaking at the same time. I said, no woman speaking and it's the individual there to interpret what's being said or let the man speak to himself. I said, wherever it is that you go, they have women speaking, they have interpreters, they have men speaking, they have interpreters. He said, well, nobody ever said that. I said, I'm not saying that. I'm saying what the Bible says. I said, but I can tell you why you want to do that. Because you're doing something you know you have no business doing, but you can still tie, untie a bow tie, and you think you haven't lost your salvation. Well, I need to think about that a little while. Okay. Well, why don't you just believe what, the, I'm not making fun of the guy. He doesn't know any better. Why don't you just see what the Bible says about it? But isn't that odd? I'm talking to a man about his soul. You don't believe in the Trinity and how you feel about tongues. How do you feel about hell? Lake of fire. Eternal judgment. Eternal damnation. Well, you know, it's all relative. Okay. Know where I'm going. Nobody can know. I know. Luke chapter number 14. I won't give you this whole thing. Pick it up. Let's just make it in 16. And um, this is the, the wife and the oxen and the property. You know the passage. It's just a picture. It's a type. It's a, a, a shadow of a God that's prepared a great supper. And everybody has been invited to go. And they all said they'd come there. Right? And so uh, he says, okay, the meal's now ready and the marriage is ready to transpire and ready to take place. And he goes back to the same individuals that he invited who said they'd come. And he goes to that first guy there and he said, well, he said, uh, I've uh, bought a piece of land and uh, I need to go take a look at it. Well, that's the kind of guy you want to do real estate business with. You say, why? He'll buy a property you don't own on the corner of a piece of property that's not yours and, and sell it to you. That's a con You mean you bought it without looking at it? See how foolish that sounds? I bet you didn't buy your house without looking at it. Did you? Did you buy it on eBay? Is that still out there? Is that still out there, eBay? I'm not trying to trap you. Is it out there? Okay. Did you buy it on eBay? Okay. Zillow. You, you probably looked at it, right? He comes to the next guy. He said, hey, the supper's ready. You're going to be able to come there? He said, well, I've bought uh, some, some oxen. I need to go try them. You bought oxen without trying them? You don't even know if they'll fit the, the harness and whether or not they'll pull a plow? And the last thing you know what he said? He said, well, I'd like to, but I married a wife. Isn't that odd how the Bible said that? The Lord had through the power of the Holy Spirit, He said that a woman can keep you men from doing what God would have you to do. Amen. Jezebel sure had an impact on old Ahab. Rhodia sure had a big impact on Herod and tied her daughter up in it. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Uh, you're going to miss the supper because you married a wife? You know what that indicates? She don't want to go. Well, you must have been unequally yoked with an unbeliever then. Because what she should say is, you got invited to that? Man, are you kidding? We get to go to that? Sure, I'm going with you. I'm going to be your plus one. <laughs> but his excuse is, I married a wife. And you know what the picture is? The picture is, is when the great white throne comes, your excuses are going to be as shallow as those excuses right there. You have no excuse for not coming in and dining with the master. But because you made a stupid excuse and you're lost, you know what happens? You come up there and the Lord said, out. That's resurrection of the dead. That's going to happen for everybody. Going all the way back to Adam. We'll get with angels a little bit later on. And that's the resurrection of the believer. And that resurrection is not just in your salvation. That resurrection is a physical resur resurrection that takes place for every departed loved one that's gone around, that's up there with God now, He's going to bring with them. They're not in the ground sleeping. Don't you believe that foolishness? He's going to bring with them. They're going to grab their body and they're going to come up. 
All right, let's stand together and be dismissed.